there's a defender named Elijah Wood. Have you ever worked in a Lord of the Rings joke during a you call? Know, uh, he, he hasn't. He hasn't made too many plays. I think he made one tackle in, in the game. But I got to get some Tolkien in there at some point, it, it, especially now that the, the Amazon series is is starting up. So yeah, it's gosh, coming. it's so bad. It's it, the Amazon series is terrible so far, but I'm still going to watch every second of it. But yeah, it's like if he goes a long way, he's like, man, he came all the way from the Shire to make that. Yeah, tackle. one ring to incredible. rule them all or something. Well, Zach, I, I actually just finished crushing yeah. some chicken farm, and I'm, I'm freaking ready to rock and roll. You are Locked On Auburn, your daily podcast on the Auburn Tigers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, welcome on into Locked On Auburn, your daily Auburn Tigers podcast. I'm your host, Zach Blackerby, and thank you so much for making Locked On Auburn your first listen every single day. Today's episode is brought to you by Upside. Download the free Upside app and use promo code LOCKED to get $5 or more cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more. And joining us now here on Locked on Auburn, the voice of San Jose State, Justin Allegri. We were talking about this before, but uh, it, it's been a minute, but you guys have made the trek over to Auburn before not too long ago. Yeah, f- for me, it's not going to be as much of a, a shock this year. I know for the players that have never been to an SEC venue, it's going to be a, a, a little bit more eye-opening, but I have always said it's one of my my favorite spots to go. I, I thought the people at Auburn were great. Uh, the atmosphere obviously uh, was second to none. And, you know, w- we showed up uh, on a Thursday last time and everybody was tailgating already. So I, I can't uh, I can't argue with that type of partying level. Yeah, I, I love that as a student, you would go to like eight o'clock classes, nine o'clock and you'd be like leaving campus at 10 or 11. And it's like. When you walk in, there was nothing there. And then when you leave, it's just like, oh, everybody's here now. It's the craziest thing, (laughs) the craziest thing for sure. So tell us about this San Jose State team. I know you guys played Portland last week. What did you learn about this squad watching them, uh, you know, kind of eke out a victory there? Yeah, it's a it's a bit of a unique uh, game this week because San Jose State, uh, typically we would see some scrimmages in fall camp um, just to kind of get a sense of where the team was at. You know, you get a little more of a look of an 11 on 11. Spartans didn't have any scrimmages this year. So really going into the Portland State game, it was the first opportunity that a lot of our fans uh, had had a mm-hmm. chance to see some of the new faces on the team. And there are a lot of new faces, especially on offense. So I, I thought there was some sluggish elements to that game. And I think a lot of that led to not having those scrimmages. And, and I know Coach Brennan has kind of talked about that with a load management being the mindset there. But I thought there were there were some times where you were just saying, all right, this this doesn't look like a team that's full go – you know, still working through some kinks, uh, and it showed. And you know, I think the Spartans are fortunate that it, it didn't it didn't break the wrong way for them that opening game. But I think they learned a lot about themselves uh, doing that. Um, you know, offensively there were some things to work on. I thought the defense played okay in that game. Uh, there are certainly some returners on the defense that can that can make a splash in the Mountain West Conference. Uh, but overall, look, it, it was a win. Uh, you can't be upset with that. And and now I think they're they're moving forward and trying to make those adjustments as best they can. I mean, it seems like there's definitely some athletes on this roster. Uh, let's start with a quarterback. Um, seems like he moved really well, had a really impressive touchdown run, but didn't see a whole lot of running after that. Is that just kind of the offense? Do they want him to be a passer first? What's kind of the, the dynamic there? He came from the University of Hawaii, which is another conference member for, for San Jose State in the Mountain West. So we kind of knew his abilities both in passing the ball and running the ball. And I think what really makes him different as opposed to the quarterback that we had a year ago in Nick Starkle is his ability to run. And I know that the Spartans want him to do that, but they don't want them, him to be the primary runner. Um, so I think maybe some of that you saw was because they wanted to try and establish a little bit more of the ground game with their running backs, which are, are guys that are less experienced in that role as a starter. Uh, but Chevin Cordero, he is he's a fabulous athlete. Um, he's been doing it in the Mountain West Conference for a number of years now, and Spartans are thrilled to have him. Uh, and they know that the, that the passing is, 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 a, is a weapon of his and maybe the completion set percentage is something they want to see go up a tick yeah. this year. But when all else fails, he's going to get you some first downs with his legs. And that's what the Spartans are really excited about. And that's something that they saw as an opponent of Chev uh, for a number of years. So I think that's what makes him unique. And, and I think it'll allow the Spartan offense to keep moving along a little bit more efficiency this year as opposed to last year. Yeah, his legs, I think, may be the most interesting part of it when San Jose State has the ball, you know, as far as storylines in this one, because 
last week when Auburn was playing Mercer, Mercer's quarterback was not near as athletic, but escaped containment a ton, a ton. And so just kind of seeing Auburn's got some really solid pass rushers, but it's like they're all just trying to get to the quarterback. And then, you know, they were too deep downfield and they were able to kind of, you know, the, you know, they they lost containment. I'm curious how they play things differently this weekend. I think whenever, whenever you go and face an SEC team, the, the big difference to me at least is the, the, the length of time in the game. And at some point, the offensive and defensive lines for an SEC program will start to just wear on you. Mm -hmm. That may not be until the third quarter or the fourth quarter, but at some point that size advantage and that athleticism that they have in those front positions is going to wear you down. For me, looking at San Jose State, this is a a, a younger and more inexperienced offensive line. There are a couple of guys on there that have been starters before, but Spartans offensive line over the last few seasons was very, very experienced group. So, we looked at the first game against Portland state as kind of a, a, a barometer of sorts to see where, where the young guys are and where the new guys are. And it's something that's going to be a, a very difficult test for them going to Auburn to, to face that big defensive front that you're talking about. And how do you at least give time to Chev to, to allow him to, to make a play with his legs or with his arm. Uh, and, and at what point does that start to wear on you as that young offensive line unit? That, that to me is one of the big storylines for this game. Sure. When San Jose State has the football, I mean, who who is the guy, Justin? Is, is it Kaiser Robinson, the running back? Is it a is it a pass catcher? Who's the guy to really watch if you're Auburn this weekend? I, I think Elijah Cooks, who came as a transfer from the University of Nevada, he's the player that will go and make a play for you. Now we've only seen him in one game for San Jose State. But we know what he's done at the University of Nevada. He, he's, he's a guy that will go up and get a football and make a play. And that's something that the Spartans didn't really have too much on the edge last year. They did two years ago when the Spartans won the Mountain West Conference Championship. He's a guy that I'm really looking forward to, to watching throughout the course of the season, how he progresses, how his relationship with Cordero improves over the course of the year. So I, I would list him number one outside of, of Cordero. The other thing that that Coach Brennan and his staff has has always done a great job of is using their tight end very, very effectively. Uh, And Derek Deese uh, was our tight end last year. He's uh, now in the NFL uh, camp. We've had other tight ends for several seasons now. Josh Oliver, it it goes back maybe 10 years where tight ends are really, really a big part of the scheme for San Jose State. And this year, uh, Sam Olson, I I think, is going to be a guy that can fit that mold. Uh, he, he doesn't have as much experience. He had a shoulder injury last year, but I think he's got the the talent. He's got the the run blocking capabilities. He can go out and, and run a, a pattern downfield and you can get a ball to him. So to me, I, I, I'm excited to watch him in action and how the Spartans utilize him best with what Cordero can do in the backfield. Now, do they typically use the tight end in line attached to the offensive line or do they put them at slot and move them around the formation? Or well, do both. A lot of times you'll see a double tight end formation right off the line. And then Olsen will sometimes go out into the slot and occasionally he'll go out wide. Uh, but I would say maybe the base is, is right on the line. Yeah, sure. Sure. Absolutely. So, I mean, how does this team feel like just looking at the scoreboard? I mean, Portland state, uh, I mean, it kind of looks like it took everything that, that the team had to kind of edge that one out. Is, is that a, is that just the way the game flow went? Is, is that, is that a little concerning or is it just one week at a time? doesn't really matter. Yeah. I think, I think the mindset of the team is one week at a time, but I, I, I know that they were kind of ticked off. I, I, I think oh. the Spartans had a great crowd. Um, they they were coming back, you know, it's your first game of the year. You want to show what you've been working on. You want to impress. Yeah. And uh, I, I don't think San Jose State likes the fact that it was a closer game than they wanted it to be. But at the same time, end result was a positive one. And now they have to reset and refocus. Um, and that's what this team has done a really good job of over the last few years is just getting back to work and, and trying to fix what went wrong or, or things that they didn't like. But I know the players, uh, if you ask them, they're they're a little they're a little ticked off as a result of, of that game. Oh, well, good for them. Good for yeah. them. Um, yeah. Holding yourself account. I think it's great. I think it's awesome. We'll get Justin thoughts on how San Jose State can pull off the upset. What exactly will they be trying to do to knock Auburn off this Saturday? But look, we've all been cringing at the pump to getting an eye popping check at your favorite restaurant. Inflation is hitting all of us where it hurts and it really hurts. That's why I started using the app Upside. Upside is an incredible app for everyone who buys gas groceries, or dines out. 
Odds are, if you're listening to this, you do probably all of those things, but you definitely do one of them. With every purchase, I'm earning cash back thanks to Upside. To get started, download the free Upside app and use my promo code LOCKED and get $5 or more cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more. It's extremely easy to use. You take a picture of the receipt, and then a little bit later, money pops in to your Upside app account. Very, very cool. Very, very user-friendly. Download the free Upside app and use promo code LOCKED, L-O-C-K-E-D, to get $5 or more cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more. That's $5 or more cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more by using promo code LOCKED. So as far as defensive play goes, I mean, two pretty athletic interceptions last yeah. week. One was, um, you know, a, a, I guess he was a corner um, undercut a route. And then the other one, was he a linebacker where he kind of like had to scoop it in the air to himself? Pretty athletic move, but who, who should we be watching on defense? Yeah, I think the defensive side of the ball is is the most uh, exciting part of this team because there are so many returners that, that come back. You have Cade Hall, who was a conference defensive player of the year two years ago uh, on, on, on the edge. Uh, Viliami Fajoko's up front. He, he's done a, a great job for the Spartans. That defensive line, they can go up to eight deep and rotate guys in, maybe even nine deep. A lot of experienced starters in that front. So that's fun to watch. And then you go into the second level where you're talking about Jordan Cobbs was the linebacker that made the – the kind of juggle tip interception sure. um, that group led by Kyle Harmon, who had 133 tackles last year, a uh, third in the nation. So he, he can work. Uh, and then you have a guy like Cobbs who's done a great job. And then in the second level, uh, Kenyon Reed made the, the pick. He's, he's a transfer from Kansas state. Uh, Nehemiah Shelton has done a nice job for the Spartans in the second level. And, and Chase Williams, who, who didn't play in the opener, uh, he's a transfer from USC who, who are, they're really excited about what he brings to the table. So, at each layer of that defense, there's somebody to watch, somebody to be excited for. And it's a group that, in my opinion, won several games for the Spartans last year just because of the defense and, and the turnovers and making stops when they needed to. So to me, that's the strength of the team heading into the year. Yeah, when I was watching San Jose State earlier in the week, I, I wrote down um, Kyle Harmon's name. Mm -hmm. And I talked about him a little bit on the show yesterday because I think something that's going to be interesting to see Auburn develop over the course of the season is their the strength of their interior offensive line. And right, I mean, a big part of that is getting to that next level. And if they can get to Harmon, I think they can get to a lot of folks. That, that That's a big matchup for me. Yeah, and, and I think you, 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 I mentioned the, the tackle numbers, and obviously you, you wouldn't want to see that many from a linebacker. But at the same time, yeah. it means that he's making a play on the ball. So, right. you, you, yes, you, you'd like to see your defensive line – hold the line. Um, but in a three, four defense, you're going to get linebackers making more tackles anyway, just in general. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think he, he's, you know, cliche, cliche. He's got a nose for the ball and he finds his way to the ball uh, every time. He, he seems like he's one of those guys that's just in the right position always. Mm -hmm. uh, another guy that I wrote down was Noah Wright, the the defensive end. I was, um, I was pretty impressed with him too, Justin. I know, I know you didn't really mention him just then, but I think uh, the pairing with him being in front of Auburn's right tackle, who I really thought exceeded my expectations last week, his name's Austin Troxel. Um, I think that's going to be a fun battle to watch. Yeah, and that's part of the depth that you're talking about. You know, the, the defensive line, they'll, they'll throw a bunch of names at you, uh, yeah. and, and they'll roll three deep at each of those positions. So, um, which, which going back to that point that I was talking about earlier, how do you wear down a, a defense? You, you do it over the course of four quarters, but if the Spartans can maintain that rotation and keep guys fresh, yeah. uh, I think they'll stand a, a better chance to help them slow that offense down from Auburn. Justin, I saw that there's a defender named Elijah Wood. Have you ever worked in a Lord of the Rings joke during a you call? Know, he hasn't, he hasn't made too many plays. I think he made one tackle in, in the game. But I got to get some Tolkien in there at some point, it, especially now that the, the Amazon series is is starting up. So yeah, it's gosh, coming. it's so bad. It's the Amazon series is terrible so far, but I'm still going to watch every second of it. But yeah, it's like if he goes a long way, like man, he came all the way from the Shire to make that. Yeah, tackle. one ring to rule them all, or something. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Um, Justin, I know I've, you've mentioned a ton of transfers for this, mm -hmm. and, and I just like would like your thoughts. That's not necessarily for like San Jose State but just like group of five schools, because when this, this news came out, right, all the folks that were against the portal and, you know, the immediate eligibility and all that, 
They said, oh, well, it's going to ruin college football because the rich are going to get richer or whatever. And it's going to be all like everybody's going to be flocking to the SEC or to yeah, Alabama yeah, and Georgia. Right. I mean, it sounds like it sounds like San Jose State's really benefited from the portal. Yeah, and, and I think I think when you talk about the power fives versus the group of five difference, the difference to me is that now you're getting transfers coming into programs at the group of five level that maybe couldn't crack a starting lineup at the power five, but they'll be starters in the group of five. And so so you're seeing players shift because they just want to be starters. Mm-hmm. And what that does is it kind of solidifies a little bit more consistency at the group of five level. Now, maybe you not you don't have them for as long. You, you may not be able to develop them as long. Right. Um, but it, it is nice to see that effect positively on group of five schools. Now, there are negatives to it, too, like you mentioned. Um, and, and I think it's not necessarily the Wild West, but at the same time, you, you've got guys that are transferring and just trying to make their one year and then get out. Um, I, I joked with our head coach, it's kind of like free agency. Uh, I turned around in, in December and all of a sudden we had a quarterback from Hawaii, two wide receivers from Nevada. We got the other guys coming in from USC, Utah. It was kind of, Whoa, you know, it, it, he's a general manager now. Um, and that's yeah. just, that's just what it is. You, you can bring in that talent. I mean, if you, if you talk maybe five, 10 years ago, it was a rarity and a real rarity mm-hmm. to bring in somebody that transferred from within the conference to your school. And now we've got four or five guys that are coming from Mountain West schools that are going to be playing right now. Um, so in, in some ways, yeah, it, 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 it's, it's uh, something that I think changes football, but I don't know that necessarily it hurts the game. Did San Jose State see a lot of people leave? Like, you know, does a hot shot freshman in you know, the Mountain West kind of perform well and then leave to go kind of power five or something like that? Did we really see that this offseason? I, not, not from, from San Jose state. And I'm trying to think of anybody in the mountain West that I. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry to put on the spot. I, I just thought that was kind of an interesting thing that I, you can't. I, you know, nothing, if, if it doesn't. Yeah. If it doesn't come to mind, it's probably a good thing. Um, I, I'm sure, I'm sure some people left and, and try to advance their career, but some of the top tier mountain West quarterbacks, especially are transfers already um, mm-hmm. that are coming in, you know, Hainer at, at, uh, at Fresno state was a transfer quarterback. Uh a lot of different programs have their transfer quarterbacks starting now uh, at their institution. Mm -hmm. I think off the top of my head, only Boise state's quarterback was a true recruit that's starting for them. Um, So yeah, there's, there's a lot of, I think the, the, the the quarterback for San Diego state came from Virginia tech uh, and then from Oregon prior. So it, it, it's, it's more rare now to have a guy that stays somewhere for four years. You're right. You're right. Is, is there any kind of weird tie from like mountain, you know, mountain West people to like Brian Harson Cause he was there for so long. Then he finally left. Is there any kind of tie there? Or am I reading too much into it? I'm sure there's ties with Boise state. And, and I know that yeah. other media members in the mountain West conference, they certainly remember coach Harson and, you know, he, he, he kept that program grinding and, and with Providence. Um, so I think a lot of people remember him. A lot of people know that he, did a great job at Boise state and he left for uh, the SEC gig. You can't blame him for that. Yeah. True. Um, I, I don't know that there's much else talk about that now. Um, I know yeah. from San Jose state's perspective, last time we saw him was in the 2020 championship. Uh, and that was, uh, I, I don't remember if he coached the bowl game that year for Boise state or not, but it might've been one of his last games, if not his last game at all at Boise state. So I think it was his last game. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there, there's there, media members remember that stuff. You know, he was somebody that you'd talk to at the media days and, uh, somebody that you, you, you know, was that, that presence in the mountain West conference. Yeah. Cool. Uh, Justin, I guess last thing before I let you go, and I really appreciate your time. If San Jose State is going to pull this off this weekend, they're going to pull off the upset. What do they have to do? We got to run the football. Uh, I, I think ultimately that's what it comes down to. The Spartans can move the ball enough, I think, to 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 get the job done. I think they've got weapons in the defense to generate a couple of turnovers, perhaps, which always is key in games like this. Uh, you have to try and win the turnover battle to get yourself extra possessions. But the bottom line is. Spartans are going to need to get first downs and they're going to have to do that on the ground. And they're probably going to need to get touchdowns and they're going to have to do that on the ground. So uh, the run game just was not where they wanted it to be in game number one. And it's got to be better, uh, especially against an SEC team. You you can't just be a a single dimension offense and trying to win at an SEC venue. You've got to bring all facets of the game and bring it, bring your A game to it. Uh, Spartans last time they played at SEC team was Arkansas. 
uh, and they won that game and it, it was not easy. And that was a down year for Arkansas. Um, so you, you just got to bring it. You got to bring it. Yeah, no, I, I think that's awesome, man. Justin, thank you so much for your time. Travel safely, my friend, and uh, hopefully Auburn treats you well. Thank you. Appreciate it, Zach. Thank you so much to Justin. Really appreciate his time. I want to talk about Auburn NIL. They finally got a win on the NIL front, and it could be huge for the Auburn football program, basketball program, baseball program. Moving forward, I'll tell you what I mean in just a moment. Today's show is brought to you by Alumni Hall. Alumni Hall is the place to shop for all of your Auburn gear. I, in fact, got this shirt from Alumni Hall, and I think I got some of the stuff that's actually behind me, if you're watching on YouTube, from Alumni Hall as well. I mentioned this earlier in the week. My uh, my daughter thinks Aubie lives there because we got our stuff. Aubie, th- you walk in there, there's just Auburn stuff all over the place, and it's legitimate. It's officially licensed. You don't have to worry about cheap knockoffs or anything like that. And look, with tailgating season being here, and it's starting to cool off a little bit, slowly but surely, there's a ton of, you know, Auburn fire pits and Auburn tailgate gear, tents, everything you can think of, they have it. And if you're listening to a daily Auburn show, you love the Tigers and you want to support your favorite team. Well, folks who truly support the Auburn Tigers get their gear at Alumni Hall. There's a location in Auburn and Opelika, or you can just go to alumnihall.com regardless of where you live. Check out our friends at Alumni Hall. So Auburn got a win on the NIL front. The new Auburn NIL collective, which formerly was NIL Auburn, new folks came in and acquired it. It is now called On to Victory. And they're in the midst of this campaign that's called 30 and 3. And in their first month, raised $10 million. And the 30 and 3 is they want to raise $30 million in three years. And so... Uh, just one month into it, they, they've already raised $10 million. And we've talked about this before. I think it's when Charlie Five joined us several, several weeks ago to talk about Auburn recruiting. But you know, 2024 is already off to a strong start. I think some of that has to do with them knowing that money will be there in the future. It's not necessarily there now, but it is in the future. And this is what we've heard, right? That NIL Auburn got the infrastructure started, which was great but it was still just lagging behind where other schools in the SEC were. And then this new group comes in onto victory. They rebrand it. They rename it. And we were just kind of told, hey, this is the future. Auburn's in good hands. You know, resources are coming. Like, okay. You know, we, we kind of heard that all summer. And then to me, this is the first bit of proof where it's like, okay, all right, maybe – Maybe things are trending up for the Auburn Tigers from an NIL perspective, which is obviously huge for recruiting, for keeping players on campus, which is an interesting dynamic now that the transfer portal is such a, such a big thing. And so, you know, we saw Auburn get NIL wins with like Tank Bixby sticking around. It kind of makes you think, did so many people choose to come back? I mean, obviously, Brian Harson has, has sold this team on this culture. Guys like um, Owen Papo, guys like Colby Wooden, but you got to think that NIL was involved somewhat with some of those decisions. Maybe not all of it, but even if it was 20% of the decision, it still was a factor. I think you're going to see less and less folks leave Auburn because you're seeing more and more folks be taken care of due to on to victory. I'm, I'm looking at the page on off on three auburnlive.com and a few notes that it says, I think Hoke wrote this. Yeah, Justin Hokinson wrote this. The collective plans to operate on 10% of all giving, um, devoting 90% of all funds back to supporting Auburn athletes. I believe NIL Auburn was 80%. And so obviously that's a nice situation to be in. On to Victory currently has 104 student athletes under contract. So that's going to be pretty much your scholarship players for football, basketball, and baseball is my general understanding. So the big three main sports, and you know they may expand Outside of that, we'll have to see. But props to On to Victory and props to the Auburn family to doing this. If you want to get involved with On to Victory, because I've seen a lot of people say, like, I don't even know how to help. I don't even know how to help Auburn from an NIL point of view. Um, this is the last note of Hoke's story. If you want to contact On to Victory, you can email them info at ontovictory.com. 
Um, or you can go to on to victory.com just to kind of get more info. I'm sure there's a sign up form or something contact form there. So, but this is huge. I mean, we've just been told for months that resources are coming, that Auburn is going to be, you know, there's a surge for Auburn to catch up with these other schools. You know, Tennessee's really got it going on. Miami's got it going on. Obviously Alabama and Georgia are in a good spot. You're seeing Florida emerge. And so I, I think this is huge. I think this is an absolutely huge thing. And it, to me, it's huge, not because of the amount. Yes, $10 million in a month is great. That's huge. Probably not sustainable, but I think it's a great start. But it's just, it's proof of what they've been telling us. And what they've been saying was, hey, this is coming. Auburn's going to be in a good spot. Yeah, we may have started slow, but we're going to catch up. To me, this is proof that, okay, all right, we're getting there. We're getting there. So we'll see what happens. And we'll see if this keeps trending in the right direction. Thank you so much once again for making Locked on Auburn your first listen every single day. Thank you so much to Justin for uh, filling us in on San Jose State. And thank you so much once again for subscribing. If you're uh, watching on YouTube, please click that subscribe button. If you're listening on audio, please leave us five stars in iTunes. Really, really helps the show out a ton. And join the Locked On Opera Discord. All you have to do is click the link in the episode description or show summary down below. We'll see you tomorrow right here on Locked On Auburn.